tonight will be in 1 Peter chapter number 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1, good damn brother Jack back, and he had a good trip. Got back on Monday and was able to give um, packets, soul winning packets, tracts, and information to all of his family members. And so let's pray that God will use that to, uh, to bring them to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. No word will go void. Some plants, some water, but God always gives the increase. And so, praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Jack, for your faithfulness and your desire to reach your family with the gospel. And that ought to be all of our desire uh, tonight. First Peter chapter number 1, and uh, we're going to be in verses 13 down through 16. Hopefully we'll be able to finish these few verses here tonight as we've been on these for the last couple of weeks. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. God has a design and a purpose for all things that we experience in our lives. And uh, nothing just sort of happens accidentally or a coincidence or, uh, boy, that was something that caught us by surprise. Uh, everything is by divine appointment, by divine plan that God allows in our life. The book of 1 Peter uh, is, is a call for you and I to live faithfully by trusting in the loving plan of the Heavenly Father. I may not know all the details of that plan, God does. And I know that God loves me and therefore I know that it's a good plan. I may not uh, understand everything that I have to go through, but I know a loving God is orchestrating it all behind the scenes. Even those things that Satan uses to distract me and discourage me, we, we understand from Romans chapter 8 that all things work together for good. And uh, God can even take those and use those for His glory. And so God knows what He's doing and we can trust Him because we're confident in His love for us. And these are truths that we build our faith upon. These are uh, anchors of hope uh, that we build our lives upon in the storms of life. And because if we don't know that God loves us when we're going through difficult times, then uh, what hope do we have uh, during those times? First Peter, as we've looked at these uh, last uh, couple of months, uh, is a book or a handbook for Christian living. Uh, all the foundations that are necessary uh, to be victorious and successful in the Christian life are all outlined for us in these few chapters uh, here in 1 Peter. Verses 3 to 5, uh, it points us to our future inheritance in heaven. Verses 6 and 9, uh, it directs us to our present joy in the midst of trials. Verses 10 to 12 reminds us of the greatness of our salvation and that what we're on now, uh, the last couple of weeks, verses 13 to 16, emphasize the importance of of holy living. And as we looked at this topic of holy living, we've divided into three different uh, sub points in regards to how we're going to be motivated to live a holy life. Uh, we saw in verse number 13, uh, we have to be focused on Christ's coming. If I'm living with, no, with the anticipation that the Lord Jesus Christ could come back right now, then that's a motivator to live a righteous life, a holy life. Not sinless, uh, not, a, not perfect, uh, but it ought to uh, be a motivator to get us on the right path uh, with the right goals. Uh, we also saw in order to be a holy people, not only are we motivated uh, by a focus on Christ's coming, but we also understood that we need to be obedient to God in all areas of our life. And that was found in verses 14 and verse number 15. Uh, God does not want us to segregate our Christian life. We don't have a secular part of our life, compartment of our life, and then have a spiritual compartment or section of our life. And uh, Sunday's our spiritual time, and uh, Wednesday night coming to church in our spiritual section, and then all other times is that secular part. You go to work, and uh, you got your household chores and family and, uh, uh, obligations, but for a child of God, every area of our life is to be spiritual. And so your home life is spiritual, uh, and uh, your work life is spiritual, and uh, your recreation time is spiritual, and obviously sleep, coming to church, and your Bible time, and your prayer time is spiritual well. So we want to be obedient to God in all areas of our life uh, above reproach. And then tonight, as uh, we look at verses 15 and 16, uh, if we're going to be a holy people, not only must we focus on Christ's coming, be obedient in all areas of our life, but thirdly, we must grow in our understanding of God's holiness. I've got to always be growing in my understanding of how awesomely holy and pure and right and godly uh, that uh, God is. Look in verse number 16 where the Bible says, Because it is written, Be ye holy, 
for I am holy. Be holy, for I am holy. Now, this implies that we have to know something about who is holy in order to be holy. And so he gives the example of be holy as what? For I am holy. And so he is the pattern. He's the example. He's who we're to look to as that role model. And so it gives us the implication then that I've got to know about God's holiness and how holy God is for me to grow in my area of holiness in my own personal life. The Christian life is a process of, of growing in my understanding and my knowing of the holiness of God. And I don't just get saved realizing that God's holiness demands punishment. Uh, and, uh, and so I deserve hell. Uh, God's grace and mercy and love allows that holiness to be satisfied. But once I become a child of God, I want to grow in my understanding. How holy is God? Because the more I understand of God's holiness, that helps me to live a more holy, a more godly life uh, as God desires, as he gives us uh, here in uh, verse 16, which is a reference from, as we looked at uh, previously, from the book of uh, Leviticus. So the knowledge of the Holy One will have a transforming effect on my life. Uh, and that's why uh, when we're not living for God, we're not walking with God, we're running from God, some areas of our lives, we don't like to spend much time in the Holy Book, the Bible. And uh, we look for opportunities not to come to church and hear the Holy Word taught and preached. Uh, we don't want to be around people uh, that, that are trying to live a holy life because it makes us feel uncomfortable. And so as we walk with God and uh, spend time with God, we're going to learn one thing. God's a holy God, and, and that's a motivation and as well as a, a know-how uh, of how to do it in regards to how we also can be a holy people. No other attribute of God is elevated to the third degree. The Bible doesn't say, as we'll see here in a moment, uh, let me give you a verse here that I want you to go to. Go to Isaiah chapter number 6. Keep a little marker here in um, 1 Peter, but go to Isaiah chapter number 6. I want to talk about the third degree uh, explanation uh, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ or of God himself. Uh, look what it says in verse uh, number 3. The Bible doesn't say here in verse number 3, uh, the Bible says, And one cried unto another and said, Holy Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And so we see no other attribute of God uh, is elevated to the third degree in the sense it doesn't say, oh, love, love, love. It doesn't say, oh, mercy, oh, mercy, oh, mercy. Uh, it doesn't say, oh, God's goodness and goodness and goodness. But the three times that it's repeated uh, is this phrase here where it says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Now don't, don't cruise past uh, flippantly that phrase that's given. When God says that God is holy one time, that's important. When it's said of God he's holy twice, that's important even more so. And when God three times, back to back to back, says holy, 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 God's trying to make a point. This is something I don't want you just to read over quickly. I want you to catch your attention in regards to the holiness of God. It's meant to stretch the boundaries of our imagination concerning the holiness of God. Whatever you think of when you hear that God is holy, you need to know that God is entirely way beyond what you even ever could imagine of the holiness of God. You say, if I say, okay, define, describe what the holiness of God is, and, and then let's elevate that three times because God said, I want to stretch your imagination. Whatever you think of God, when you say holy, I want you beyond that to, to stretch that imagination. He's much holier than you ever thought holiness could be. But even holy, holy, holy uh, was not enough to capture the greatness of God's holiness. Look what he says in the last part of the verse. He had to add this. The whole earth is filled with his glory. So God is holy, 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 and, and beyond our understanding, beyond our comprehension, but so much more than that, the whole earth can't even contain the greatness of the glory and the holiness and the awesomeness of God. And so how great is the holiness of this Lord of hosts? Great enough to fill the whole earth. Great enough to fill this whole earth. And so uh, we don't understand the depth and we don't understand the, the comprehensiveness of the holiness of God. And so that's why part of our Christian life is I want to grow in my understanding of how holy is God because it's going to make a difference in my life. It's going to help me to uh, be benefit my life, my walk with God. But if I just realize holy, 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 and that's it. God said I want to stretch 
your imagination. I want you to really understand how holy I am. And, and that's what we want to look at a little bit to tonight. And so the descriptions that are given here in Isaiah are meant to blow our minds away with the thought that God is unlike anything that you and I have ever encountered. And so that's why I'll often say, uh, who's the best person uh, out soul that you know in your life? Uh, is it your dad? Is it your grandma? Is it uh, a brother or sister? Is it your spouse? Who's the best person you ever you know? And a lot of times we'll go back to a mom or a grandma. And I'll say, even as great and good as they were as a person, they were still a sinner. And, and so God wants us to stretch our imagination. What do you think holy is? When you say God wants you to be holy, what's that mean? What's that mean when God says, be holy as I am holy? And the, the example that God uh, gives to us. So here's what I'd like us to do tonight, just for a moment. I'm going to ask us in just a moment to bow our heads. And we're going to have just a, a moment of silence. I want you to ask God in this lesson tonight to reveal maybe another dimension, another uh, aspect, another layer of God's holiness as you've tried to define the holiness of God. And I want God to give us tonight a greater understanding, a greater glimpse, a, a, a greater a depth of comprehending of the holiness of God. And so let's ask God for just a few moments uh, here to ask God in a, in a moment of silence to ask that. Pray that to God in your heart tonight just for a few moments. Father, tonight I don't understand the importance of growing in your understanding of the holiness of who you are. But we see in Scripture, Lord, it's vital for us to be holy as you are holy. So my holiness is going to be limited to the extent that I understand what your holiness is. And so as I grow in my Christian life of what it means for God to be holy, then that's going to help me. Be a better servant. It's going to help me to fulfill the command that you give us here in 1 Peter, verse number 16. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to unveil another layer of your holiness tonight to us. Help us to grow in understanding that holiness in Jesus' name. Amen. Today it's rather easy to lose sight of the holiness of God. Many of, many of us are very flippant when it comes to our knowledge of God. He's our Savior. He's forgiven us of our sins. But beyond that, we don't know much about God. Many Christians talk about God without any fear of the awesomeness of His absolute holiness. Many people speak of God as some man in the sky rather than the creator of the universe. They reference Him as in some um, uh, uh, terminology that doesn't exalt Him at all but brings Him down uh, to our level. Every time in the Bible someone got a glimpse of God or a glimpse of Christ in his resurrected glory, the person always fell down on his face. He was never uh, arrogant. He was never proud. Uh, he was never uh, boastful. Uh, he was always very much as Isaiah was, woe is me. I'm, I'm undone. And uh, why? Because I'm in the presence of holy, holy, holy. All of the earth cannot contain the glory of the holiness of God. Uh, to live a holy life is to live a life in the likeness of God. You see, God is a standard of holiness. No other standard is necessary. I'm not the standard of holiness. God is. You know why? Because people change, but God doesn't. Uh, churches are not the standard of holiness because churches change, but God doesn't. Colleges are not the standard of holiness because colleges change, but God's standards of holiness stay the same. Uh, our world, our culture changes. You can look back uh, through old TV programs and, and see the, the, the attire and the way that uh, the, the folks dressed 50 years ago. And, and you can fast track now to where we are and how we dress today. And uh, we can look at one another as a standard of what's right, what's godly, what's holy. Uh, but we're not the standard. God is a standard. And so that's why we've got to grow in our understanding of holiness as it relates to God, uh, not as it relates to you or as it relates to me, but am I growing in this area? And, and we'll never totally exhaust the holiness of God. Uh, as we look at this thought of holiness, uh, Hannah professed in her prayer in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2, there is none holy as the Lord, 
for there's none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. And so in her prayer, she says, none is as holy as you are. I wonder how that would change our prayer life if we added holiness in the presence of God. He says, you boldly enter the presence of God. But realize, you're not just going to the presence of God. You're going to the presence of a holy God and a righteous God that allow, allow us to lie prostrate on the ground for that holy God as a sinner that we are. But we just flippantly approach God. We shake our fists at God. He doesn't answer our prayer and give us what we want or what we desire. No idea at all about what this thing about holiness is when God allows us as sinners to come into the presence of a holy God. Hannah understood the importance. The writer of Hebrews revealed in Hebrews 12, 14. He says, follow peace with all man and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. You want to have a close walk with God? It's time to how holy we are. And uh, God says that's the standard. So holy nat a nature of God demands a people who are holy consecrated, pure, set apart from the defiling acts and behaviors of this world. Now the word holy is an interesting word. It comes from the Hebrew word kudosh, which means to cut, to cut. To holy means to be cut off or separate from everything else that's not holy. And so if God is the standard of holiness and the word holy means to cut, uh, then God said you need to cut, uh, you need to break off. Uh, you need to separate from anything that's going to prevent you from being able to grow in your knowledge and understanding of what God's holiness is. It's to be uh, in a class of your own, distinct from anything that has ever existed or ever will exist. The word kwadash also means, the second meaning, to be holy means to be entirely morally pure all the time and in every way possible. So when you put those two elements of the word holiness together, you're left with only one conclusion, that the Lord of hosts is a sum and definition of what holiness is. He's a standard. He's a standard. And too many of us look to others on social media, we'll look to others in our church, we'll look to other churches we were raised at, and say, well, they do it over here, and uh, they live this way, they act this way, they dress that way, they listen to that kind of music. They're not the standard. The standard of holiness is God. And when we get away from the holy standard of God, what happens? We compromise. And when we compromise, the end result is we begin to drift away from God. We won't know God unless we live a life of well, there's got to be that cutting, uh, that cutting away. And so God occupies a moral space that no one else has ever occupied before. And as such, you and I have no experience or frame of reference to understand what it's like to be holy apart from God. Because your best example is not a good example. No matter how good that role model has been, no matter what a godly person you think that person is, they're not the standard. God is. And we've got to find our growth in understanding the holiness of God. That's helpful, needful, beneficial all of us. So if I was to ask you tonight, how is the holiness of God revealed? How does God reveal His holiness? Here's the answer. In everything, at all times, in all places, God's holiness is a part of everything He does. Everything God thinks, everything God desires, everything God speaks, everything that God does is utterly holy in every way. God is holy in every attribute, in every action. He is holy in His justice. He is holy in His love. He is holy in His mercy. He is holy in His power. He is holy in His sovereignty. He is holy in His wisdom, in His patience. He is holy in His anger. He is holy in His grace. He is holy in His faithfulness. And He's even holy in His holiness. Listen, God wants to broaden our sight to say God is big. This thing of holiness, holy, holy, holy. Don't pass over that. Understand the value, the significance to live a life of holiness is to look to the pattern of who God is and learn and grow. Listen, you ought to know more about God's holiness today than you did when you first got saved. 
and uh, you ought to be growing in your understanding. God's a holy God. God's a holy God. God's a holy God. That's what Christian growth and spiritual growth is all about. Holiness. Now, what's that have to do with us? This is a big doctrine. We won't understand it. But how's this big doctrine of holiness, how's it impact my real life? What impact can the holiness of God do for me? Well, I think there's three things we'll look at tonight. We'll be done. Number one, holiness provides comfort. Holiness provides comfort. You say, well, how does holiness provide comfort? Let me help you. In a world that seems out of control, in a world that's filled with evil, where wrong seems to go rewarded and right seems to be punished, it's vital to remember the holiness of God. If we're not careful, we can look at and begin to become envious of the sinners because it looks like they have everything going their way. And we can look at those who are trying to live righteous and godly and it seems like everything's going wrong in their lives. But we understand the holiness of God and we're growing in the holiness of God. Then we begin to find comfort in this thing called holiness. What he does, God does, is always right. What he says is always true. What he promises, he will always deliver. You have to preach this over and over again in your mind. When you see those that are not living for God, where it seems like there's blessings, you got to remind yourself, God always is right. God always says what's true. God is holy. God is holy. And that holiness brings a comfort knowing that God is going to make sure that the rightness of your right is going to be rewarded. And the wrongness of the wrong is also going to be punished. And so evil is not in control. Injustice does not rule. Corruption is not king. Satan will not have victory. God is, always will be, worthy of your trust. Why? He's holy. And that should give you comfort. Oh, the world's going to pot, and uh, the life seems so out of control, and evil's abounding, and the devil's winning. No, sir. Holiness gives you the comfort to know God's holy. And uh, you're not going to be able to do anything uh, without God uh, getting the final word in. So, number one, how does a big doctrine of holiness affect and impact a real life like mine? Well, it provides comfort. But secondly, holiness produces conviction. It also produces conviction. Two things that every human being absolutely must come to understand uh, are this, the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man. Those are two things we have to understand. If we're going to grow beyond the stagnant stage of our life, we have to understand God's holy. I'm going to grow in that. But I also have to understand the sinfulness of the heart of man, myself. And as I grow in those areas, that's what spiritual growth is, and that's what holiness does. It produces a conviction in our heart. Now, these topics are very difficult for you and I to face, but they go together. If we understand who God is, we get a, a glimpse of His majesty, His purity, of His holiness. It's then that we begin to become aware of our corruption, of our defilement, of our sinfulness, of our wickedness. See, when you think you're pretty good, You've stopped growing for some time because you've neglected to grow in the holiness of God. When you think you and I, we've arrived in this Christian life, and boy, I'm somebody, and I'm a, a great Christian. Look what I've done, and look what I've accomplished. And look how I'm living for God. Oh, you've neglected something very important called the holiness of God. Because when you're growing in the holiness of God, it'll always convict you. It produces conviction in your heart to realize how unworthy we are of that God that we serve. It, it creates that, that, that conviction on the inside. So discover the impact that the holiness of God has in our life. We need to return back to Isaiah verse, chapter number 6. Look what it says in verse number 5. Are you still there? Isaiah chapter 6. We saw in verse number uh, 3, uh, Isaiah cried unto, unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Don't forget that. Uh, don't just slightly go over that. Circle each of those holies. Recognize that the only attribute of God that is amplified is the holiness of God. Let's read on. Verse number four. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him. The cry in the house was filled with the smoke. Notice what uh, uh, Isaiah said. Then said I, woe is me. I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. What did he say? Holy, holy, holy. Then he said, woe is me. When you're saying, look at me, instead of woe is me, then you're missing the holiness of God. 
When you say, why don't you pat me on the back, instead of saying, woe is me, you've not spent time growing in the holiness of God. Listen, as you grow in this thing of knowing of God's holiness, you're going to understand, woe is me. The more woes you're going to understand that we're deserving of. As a result, he says, I'm undone. Isaiah doesn't have a wow moment uh, in response to the holiness of God, uh, though he's blown away with it when he says, holy, holy, holy. But this blown away uh, experience in brokenness because he recognizes how wicked he is and how far he is from God. He says, woe is me. Look what it says. Uh, For I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. He says, I am so far from God. I don't even dwell in the presence of God. Why did he feel that way? Well, we got to build up our self-esteem. And we got to build up our self-confidence. And we got to build up our ego. Listen, the way you're going to grow spiritually is not by having a better self-esteem. It's having a better God-esteem. Because God's the one that reveals the true who you are. But gives us us the strength to do what we could never do in our own power, in our own strength. And so in a flash of a moment, Isaiah has a new uh, understanding of sin. He saw it as it was pervasive in himself and in everyone else. It's easy uh, in our uh, self-righteousness to see sin in everybody else. It's easy in our uh, self-glorification of ourselves uh, to look at the imperfections of others. But when we see the holiness of God, we're not looking at, at others first. We're looking at myself first. Whoa, is me. And he says, I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. Most of us put the blame on the unclean people and the unclean people are having a bad influence on me. He was saying, I'm unclean and I'm having a bad influence on the people that I dwell with. I'm the wrong crowd. I'm the wrong person. I'm the one that's not living for God. That's what Isaiah uh, responded when he was in the presence of God. And so it produces a conviction that knowledge will make us more holy in all uh, of our behavior. Now, holiness is not simply just knowing about God. Knowledge and holiness don't go hand in hand necessarily. You can have knowledge of sin but not be repentant. So knowledge and holiness are not the same. We do what we do knowing it's wrong, but we still do it. If you understood the holiness of God, you wouldn't do it. We wouldn't make that choice if we're growing in the holiness of God. Let me say this also. Holiness does not mean that you never sin. Those who seek holiness realize just how sinful they actually are. The closer we draw to God, the clearer sin becomes to us. And it's not becomes more blurred and more raised and more difficult and more compromised. It's more clear to us. Why? Because we're growing in how holy God He is. And God in His holiness, holy, holy, holy. It's a motivation to understand, listen, God's holy. And He's a standard that we're to look to. And as you're growing in that standard, it's going to reveal something about you. It's going to reveal something about me. I'm wicked. I'm sinful. I'm vile. I'm not who I think I, uh, I am. I'm not uh, doing what I could be doing. I'm far from what I ought to be. But if I'm looking at you, and I'm looking at others, and I want others to get a pat on my back, then I've lost the importance of growing in the holiness of God. See, this is a key. This is a key to our Christian life. Are you growing? When you go into God in prayer, do you say, Dear God, I enter into your presence as the holy, righteous God, and I feel so unworthy as I come into your presence as a holy, holy, holy. And when you begin to recognize why the first step of prayer is worship God, and then comes confession. Confession doesn't come first. Worshiping God comes first. Why? Because when you worship the attributes of who God is, and the character qualities of who God is, and you begin to realize how awesome and holy and righteous He is, what's it do? That holiness awareness makes you aware of that sin. Now you begin to confess, and dear God, uh, woe is me. I'm undone. Would you please forgive me in this area? I've had a bad attitude in this area, and God, please forgive me of this. Uh, thoughts I've had here, and oh God, you're such a holy God, and as you focus and worship God in His holiness, He begins to reveal to you clearly now the sinfulness that we are in the presence of a holy God. And then we begin to confess our sins to God. And then the next part of that prayer is thanksgiving. So you go to God in worship, bragging and praising Him for who He is. As you focus on how awesome and holy He is and, and great He is, it reveals something about us, clearly sin. 
in our lives. We confess it, and now we thank God uh, for His forgiveness. We thank God for His blessings, knowing we're undeserving of it because we've seen the holiness of God. We've seen our own sinfulness. We've confessed it to God, but God still blesses us, and God still wants to use us. And now we have a grateful heart. And then we go into asking. And then that's what prayer is, a part of asking. You've not prayed when you've worshiped God. You've not prayed when you've confessed your sins. You've not prayed when you've thanked God. You pray by definition is to ask. So your prayer time is asking. But you preface your prayer uh, before you ask with worship and confession and, uh, and thankfulness or gratefulness to God. Then you lay your petitions before God. And then you end your prayer, not my will, but thy will be done. Not my will, but thy will be done. And God, I, want, I don't want anything that I've asked for, if it's outside of your will, to be accomplished. And Lord, the Holy Spirit of God then intercedes on our behalf. The Bible says, and um, uttereth words and groanings that cannot be uttered, uh, uh, that we don't understand. He intercedes on our behalf as uh, we yield to him. So holiness does not mean we never sin. Holiness is not simply knowing about God. I can know about sin and not be repentant about it. And then also this, holiness is not about what, holiness is not as much about what I don't do as it is about why I don't do something. Let me say that again. Holiness is not as much about what I don't do as it is about why I don't do something. Uh, and so we talked about that a couple weeks ago, the motives behind why we do what we do. It's not about, why well, don't do this, and I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do this, and I'm holy. No, it's the motivation of why don't you do those things. Why don't you do that? Why don't you act that way? Why don't you dress that way? Why don't you talk that way? Why don't you behave that way? Why don't you uh, go to those uh, uh, so, you know, uh, places? And why don't you do that? So the reason is behind why. You don't do that. And as a result of I don't do that, it's safe to assume that those who live strictly by rules rather than that true relationship with Christ are not holy. They're religious, but they're not holy. They may avoid people. They may avoid places. They may avoid things. Uh, and uh, they, may, they may be critical, judgmental, and jealous, and arrogant, and angry. They have a form of godliness, but deny what? The power thereof in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 5. So I'm not holy because of what I don't do. I'm holy because of why I don't do it, because God's holy. And God deserves me to be growing in my understanding of His holiness. And He reveals to me things in my life. Uh, that need to be changed or adjusted or improved upon uh, and fixed. And so it's only at the face, uh, in the face of holiness of God that you and I, like Isaiah, will ever be broken by the sin uh, that lives within us. Take your Bibles and go to Romans chapter 7, please, in verse number 13. Romans chapter 7, in verse number 13. These are not topics we've had the last several weeks as we conclude it tonight. Uh, holiness is not a topic that is heard uh, much in, in our churches today, even sad to say, in our independent Baptist churches uh, with all the new um, uh, philosophies and ideologies that are out there. Uh, but God's word, the holy book, and God's standard, the holy God, uh, doesn't change. Romans chapter 7, look what it says in verse number 13. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, verse 13, chapter 7. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. You might want to look at that little phrase there, those words there, exceeding sinful. We ought to look at sin in our lives, not the lives of others, in our lives. We ought to look at the sin in our lives as exceeding sinful. You say, how are you going to grow to where sin, sin, isn't it? Yeah, but God says it should be exceeding sinful. What was wrong a year ago in your life as you're growing in your understanding of God's holiness? It shouldn't just be wrong. It's now really wrong. And uh, as you grow again and you understand the holiness of God, what was once wrong and, and now it's really wrong. Now it's really, really wrong. And, uh, and as you grow in the holiness of God, listen, you're growing in the exceeding sinfulness of sin. You're not compromising. You're not getting lazy. You're not drifting the longer you're saved. You're becoming more aware of the sin in your life. And it's not just bad. It's really bad. And it's really, really bad. 
That's what you look at sin. And guess what? You'll get victory over that sin. You won't be tempted to draw back that sin if you're growing in the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Our problem is, oh yeah, it's wrong, and that's it. We, it never gets worse than that. Oh yeah, it's a sin, but it never gets worse than just a sin. And uh, it needs to be growing to where it's, it's really sin. It's really, really sin. And uh, it's exceeding sinful. It's really, really bad. And when you get to that point, you begin to see yourself growing. But you're not going to get to that point unless you're growing in this spot. The holiness of God. The holiness of God. Understanding how holy God is. You see, we have a problem. Sin doesn't always appear sinful to us. In fact, it's often magnetic. It's often very attractive to us, alluring. That's why the Bible says in James, as he is enticed, and what? You're drawn away like a bait on a hook, and that fish goes by and smells and sees it. He's attracted to that. The problem with this world is our old flesh is attracted to sin. But as we become more alone in time with God's holiness, we become less attracted to sin and because we don't just see it as, oh, yeah, that's a sin. No, that's really, really exceeding sinful. What? It's, it's either right or wrong. No, it's, it's really, really, really wrong. Why? Because God is really, really, really holy, holy, holy. And as you grow in that, the whole world, the whole earth is full of his glory. So that means what? You've had a lifetime to learn about the holiness of God. So why is it Christians start off more holy the first years of their, their Christian life, and the longer they're saved, the less holy they become? Because they're not growing in their holiness of God. They're looking at others as a standard. They're looking at others as a pattern. They're looking at others as an example, and they're losing the focus that the standard is God. And that holy God is always room that we can grow. We can always learn a little bit more about the holiness of God. And so when we sin... We want to describe our sinful activity in terms of a mistake, as a failure, as, as a drop ball, uh, because it sort of softens and mitigates the guilt of what we did. There's something a little bit more difficult about saying it was a sin versus I made a mistake. I, I didn't you tell that, you know, they don't even want to say that they lie. They say, well, you sort of exaggerated the truth. Or you sort of, you know, there's just something about not making sin. We want to uh, water down sin today. We want to politicize sin today where it's not exceeding sinful. And sad to say, we've got a lot of Christians that have been drawn into that. We're saying, well, it's not that bad. You know, everybody's doing it anyway. And that's sort of the direction our culture is going. And, and that's sort of this new generation anyway. That's just sort of the way they think. And that we just got to accept it the way it is. No, we don't. God's standard is a standard. That holiness is we've got to grow in our growing of that understanding of the knowledge of God's holiness in our lives. And so when we sin, uh, but when we look at the face of God's holiness, we read realize how sinful we are. So it's the holiness of God that tells us that since we cannot escape ourselves, we all need a Savior. We can't do it on our own. We need God to save us through Jesus Christ. And so it draws us to the need of a Savior. If I don't see a holy God, I don't see my sinfulness. If I don't see my sinfulness, I don't see a need to help me in my wicked, depraved condition. But when I see the holiness of God, and I see the sinfulness of myself, then I realize, God, I need you to help me get victory over this sin. I need you to help me get victory over this bad attitude. I need you to help me get victory over this area. Lord, I need you because I, I can't do it. I need to do it, but I can't do it on my own. The holiness of God. So you simply cannot consider the holiness of God without also mourning your sin and crying out for the grace of God to help you find victory because you won't do it. You won't do it uh, as you go. So I said, number one, Holiness, as we look at this thing of holiness, it provides, how does it help me, this doctrine? Well, it provides comfort. Number two, it produces conviction. And then lastly, it precedes uh, my calling. It precedes my calling. Uh, go back and we'll end on this in, in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1. We've seen this. The Bible says uh, in verse number 14 down through verse number 16, as we look at this um, verse where it talks about we're called. We're called. Look what it says. Uh, but uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse number, um, uh, let's go down to, let's see where we're at. Verse number 14. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as, notice down the next words, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be holy. So holiness precedes my calling. Uh, meaning what? A holy God calls me to do what? To be holy. 
He says right here, he says, I have called you, he which has called you is holy, so be holy. That's your calling. Boy, I wish I knew what my calling in life was. I wish I knew what my purpose was in life. I knew, wish I knew what the will of God was for life. Here it is. Here it is. God's a holy God has called you to be holy in all manner of conversation. And he wants you. You say, all right, I got it. But you've got to grow. You've got to grow. You've got to keep growing in knowing how holy God is. This would be a great study for 2021 to look at what? I want to understand how holy God really is. I want to understand the depth of God's holiness. And the more you realize how awesomely and great and powerful holy God is, then you're going to see something about yourself that you never saw before. But that's where revival takes place. That's where transformation takes place. That's where the miracles are. That's where the great answers to prayer are. But you've got to get to where you see yourself, where I see myself the way I really am. Uh, and this is the best way to understand it. You are holy. You've been called to be holy. 2 Timothy 1.9 says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. I says holiness precedes a calling. God says, I've called you to what? A holy calling. A holy calling. That's your job. Listen, God's holiness uh, circumference, uh, 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 surrounds every area of his attributes. And God says, every area of your life, I want to be surrounded by holiness. That's your calling. You work a job. Your job is there. But your ultimate purpose of that job is to live out your calling to be holy in your marriage. You're, you're, you've got to be a good husband, a good wife. But your ultimate calling is to be holy as a husband and a wife. As a parent, God's given you those children. But your ultimate calling is to be holy as a mom and dad. Holy in every area of your life like God is holy in every area. God said, I want you to be holy in every area of conversation of your life. Why? That's your calling. That's your calling. Uh, that's our job. And our allegiance is no longer uh, to this kingdom of our success and our goals and our happiness, but to the progressing and the, pro the propagation of the kingdom of God. Paul says in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. He said, listen, I'm a separated, holy Christian. Why? Because my purpose is to propagate the holiness of God, separate under the gospel. Why do you live a godly, holy, righteous, separate life? So you can be a great witness in sharing the gospel. That's your calling. And so everything that we do is wrapped in the package of the holiness of God. You've been called to live a holy life. And where do you do this? You do it wherever you are, whomever you're with, and whatever you're doing. It doesn't matter. You're to live your calling everywhere you go is to be holy in all manner. Of conversation. As you consider the impossibility of this call, I want you to remind you of this. God never calls us to do th something that he doesn't empower us to succeed at. So if God calls us to be holy, he said it's impossible. I know in your own strength and power, but God equips those he calls. And so if God calls us to be holy, he's an example. How do you, how do you, how do you get equipped to, to fulfill this call? Here's the key. You've got to grow in your understanding of God's holiness. You've got to grow in your understanding. And if you don't see a holier God today, and I don't know how long you've been saved, than he was when you first got saved, then shame on us. Shame on us. We ought to be growing and understanding. Isaiah said, holy, holy, holy. We just read over that verse quickly. It doesn't make much sense. We've even memorized it maybe. And, and then he goes on and says, then he says, woe to me. Woe is me. He says, I'm unclean lips. He says, I'm a wicked person. And God says, now I can use you. Now I can grow you. Now you're pliable. Now you're in a position you can accomplish something great for God. But it's not because your talents, your abilities, your skills. It's when you see yourself the way you really are. When I see myself the way I really am. But I won't see it because I point it out in your life. You won't see I won't see it because you point out in my life. We'll only see it when we see a holy God. Because if I show you your error of your sin, you'll become defensive. You'll defend it and justify it and rationalize why you do what you do. You'll excuse it. If you point out my sin in my life, my tendency is what? Naturally to defend it and, and, to, and deflect it and focus on you. But when my focus is not you or myself but on the holiness of God, then God does a pretty good job at revealing in my heart, you're not as good as you think you are. You've not arrived yet. And we'll never get there because the holiness of God fills the whole earth 
How long do you think in a lifetime it would take us to grow in the understanding of God's holiness if it's, if it's in the whole earth? I mean, if we had a whole life to go to every city of this whole earth, uh, in a lifetime you couldn't do it. Traveling with the technology and things we have, we couldn't go to all the areas. We couldn't probably even do it online on the Internet and go to all the different cities and read about the cities around the world. And God says, my holiness engulfs all of this. So you'll never exhaust the holiness of God. And so as you read your Bible, God, as I'm about to read the word today, would you please reveal to me an aspect of your holiness? Because I want to grow in understanding how holy you are. And God, as I come into your presence today in prayer, I just want to remind myself of what a holy God I'm in the presence of. You're a holy God. That means you're pure. That means to be, to be cut off. That means you're separate from anything that's defiled and impure, and you're a perfect and holy God. When you begin to worship God and thank Him for His holiness, God begins to reveal to us our sinfulness. And so, God, please forgive me. I'm so sorry. I, I've not been living the way I should be living. I'm so sorry. Please, and God, thank you for not giving up on me. And thank you, God, for your patience. Your long suffering. Thank you, God, for forgiving me. And God, please just help me to understand and grow. I never want to exhaust and feel I've arrived in this Christian life. I always want to be growing in how holy you are. Now, God, as I come before you in my prayers, and I've got folks that I love and I care about, and you begin to list off your prayer request. And Lord, I've I've told you a lot of things. But Lord, I, all I want more than anything else, because you're a holy God. You're a holy God, I want your will done. Because your will is what's going to bring fulfillment in my life. Your will is what's going to bring happiness and joy in my life. God, not my will, but thy will be done. God, so as I say amen to this prayer, I just want you to know whatever the results are, it doesn't change my perspective about how holy you are. If anything, it grows my understanding of your holiness. 